just began. Make sure everyone can hear me. Anyone have any problems hearing me? Okay. Um, let's see. I've had at least one student ask me about um, master's exams. And at this point in time, I've not heard what campus is planning to do about the fall semester, whether it will be online again or in class. I did inquire and asked them when they would, they might know. And the answer I got back was they hope to announce before the end of the semester. Second, I've had some you know, questions about the credit, no credit option. Um, there was some confusion. Um, if you take a course at a graduate level um, and get a letter grade, then any grade C or above will count um, towards your three units in the POS. Um, tip, normally, um, we do not allow graduate students to take regular classes like this one and take them from credit, no credit, and apply them to a different degree. Um, the university is making an exception this semester due to August circumstances. Um, so it is possible for you to, until like May 1st or May 7th, as the deadline was, to actually request to take and have a class credit, no credit. Um, confusion came in. Um, if you take a course credit, no credit, then credit means a B or better. Uh, so a B minus or low means no credit. And if you get no credit in a class, it doesn't count. Um, but again, for regular coursework, you can get a letter grade. The, um, uh, C or greater in a grade level course will count. Yeah, let me turn that off. Um, that time was um, in students mentoring. Any questions? Yes, the more. Uh, professor, can you hear me? Yes, I can. So, uh, as you said in the last class, that uh, you were you were wanted to see if we could run our code on the latest data on COVID nineteen. Yeah. So I tried to do that, and uh, from what I what I can find is that uh, based on the numbers of new cases per week, mm -hmm. we have actually peaked in the last two weeks. Uh, like throughout the country, like right. new new confirmed cases per week for the whole country, they have they they have touched their peak in the last two weeks, and that number is now going down. And also for the new deaths per week, the the rate of increase of new deaths per week is also decreasing. Yeah, one would expect the deaths to lag behind. Yeah. I can I can show you the figure if you're interested. I have the notebook opened on my system. Yeah, just just a minute. Let me. Okay, yeah, I can share your screen now. Okay. Okay, can you see the screen? Yeah, I just have to move the window out of the way. Yes, and I assume everyone else can see it too. Yeah. So like from here, from this data frame, we can see the last column missed 21st April, just to make sure that I got the latest data. And if we go down, if we look at this thing, confirmed cases per day, I mean, this plot still shows that it is, it is increasing exponentially. But if you look at the, uh, this is log scale. All right. 
Yes, but if you look at this thing, confirmed new cases per week, right. this has actually reached a peak uh, around April 7th. And now on the 21st of April, that number is actually lower than the what, what it was two weeks ago. I mean, even if in this, this table, in the last two weeks, the new cases were 200,000, 200, 208,000 uh, uh, for the, both the weeks. But the, this week, it has been uh, 198,000. So they have decreased by 10,000. Now, how, so 421 is the end of your week? Yes, 421 is the end of my week. So okay. I'm going on a Tuesday to Tuesday basis. Okay. So this is the confirmed new cases per week. And if we go down to see the death rate, yes, uh, new deaths per week. We can right. see over here that the slope Right. Over, uh, in this curve is actually decreasing. The slope is the highest over here on uh, the week of 4.7. Mm -hmm. But over here on the week of 4.15, the slope has decreased from what it was over here. And this in this week, the slope has decreased even further. And if I show you the county data, uh, especially the New York counties. No. Yeah, this thing, new COVID-19 cases per day. The peak has been uh, the peak has been shown to be around somewhere around four uh, April fifteenth, and now the new cases are decreasing dramatically. So we are the numbers are almost as same as they were around uh, March twenty eighth. So these are the five counties in New York City: Bronx, Kings, right. uh, New York County, Queens, and Richmond. Right. And if we look at the Seattle data. Then over here also, we can see the new cases per day has been decreasing. Right. So just wanted to show this. Yeah. You know. so I think I think you're on the right track. Yeah. Yeah. Hopefully, I mean, given the financial stress everyone's put under, but yeah. Well, thank you for that. Yeah. Thank you, Professor. Uh, Professor? Yes. Uh, I had a question here. Yeah. Uh, wouldn't it be too early to determine that we have reached peak uh, throughout the country? Because uh, what we could see from the data was the main contribution of the uh, numbers were seen from a single state uh, that was New York. And uh, maybe New York is uh, in a way achieving a peak. But uh, there may be other states with a huge amount of population. They may still be on a rising, uh, uh, rising scene, and we may still we, we may still uh, come to a point wherein, at a country level, we are not yet uh, reached the peak. I mean, yeah, but we won't. We won't know if it's you know, local maximum or a global maximum for a long time. Um, but clearly, you know, the numbers are headed in the right direction. Um, you know, we'll see that also given the fact that, you know, various states have, you know, started to open up, um, things could reverse so yeah so we'll see um these things aren't going up as fast as they were and they come down a little bit any other questions or comments okay oh, I want to talk about a few things today, and um, I, I'm planning this will be our you know, last formal lecture um, for a couple of reasons. One is, you know, again, I expect people are busy, and so you need more time to work on projects. Um, another reason is if I keep on preparing new material, I won't get the grading, I need to get the grading done. Um, 
And so starting next week, I'll have, I'll be here at 5.30, if you have questions, um, about your projects or issues. And so there's a few things I want to talk about. Um, yeah, so last time I was looking at um, combining Kafka and Cassandra, and I had this sort of um, scenario in a bunch of stores, and the stores and pump the sales into the Kafka stream, um, and then we could um, use that Kafka stream to both the other input going to Cassandra, and you know perhaps send to Spark to do some analysis. Um, you know, I did actually run this example using Python. Um, and generally, you probably wouldn't want to do it in production Python. You'd want to use the Kafka um, connectors and streams. Um, so my simple example, I only got two, I got one store and it sells two products labeled A and B. Um, and each time it sells something, I'm going to generate this um, simple JSON object where was item A or B, how many were sold, and then a timestamp, but my timestamp is just, just an integer going from you know one up to N. Uh, professor? Yeah. You know you're not sharing the slides with us. Oh, oh, oh. I was like, I think I know what he's talking about, but I'm not exactly sure. <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay. And for some reason, I lose the chat window. So I need to get that back. Okay. So here we go. Try it again. Um, yes, yeah, so like I said, I, you know, I'm gonna have a single store. Um, it's gonna sell two products, A and B. And each time it sells an item, reach sale is going to generate a JSON object, and it's going to just represent whether they sold item A or B, and how many they sold, and then a timestamp, which is fake, which is to be an integer from one to n. Um, now when you when you build such a system, um, you know, we're going to create a bunch of different small services that run on their own process. Um, so to start Kafka, we need the zookeeper. The zookeeper is used by Kafka to keep track of, um, you know, which Kafka server is up and running. Um, and just some other things to this. And then we bought here. And if we start off the server and then to start Cassandra. And then I kept all those windows open because I, I so I can see the um, blogs we're producing. And then I need to create a topic in Kafka. One is going to be the sales. And that's going to be again, just what the stores are going to write to. And then later we'll get um, sales summary. Um, and then we need to create a key space or what most people call a database in Cassandra. And again, you know, I'm not doing any fancy, it's only one on my laptop. And then I have to create a table and the table um, just has the item, the amount, and the time. I'm using the time as the primary key. Now my Kafka is set up in my 
Cassandra set up. Um, and then um, I just have you know, a function in Python to randomly generate whether it should be A or B. Um, and then another function to randomly generate how many items is sold. Um, and I purchase just calls those two functions return their two values. Um, and then my store just makes a purchase and then um, calls cock this in on it and I copy the district, send it to the um, my Kafka um, server. That's it. And so I basically have this loop that runs. Um, and then we need to create a producer. And so I create a you know, random number generator in Python. And then um, my producer, you know, I think the interesting thing here is I have to tell how I'm going to serialize it, which is JSON. And then I ran it. Um, and that produces, you know, starts sending information to my Kafka um, server. Again, it's nothing. I think very complicated once you get everything set up. Um, now we want to be able to take and read from Kafka stream and send it to Cassandra. Um, so again, in general, you probably want to Kafka um, an extra through this. And I did a Python and Python again. I need like copy the to read it from Kafka. Um, and then I need to connect to um, Cassandra. Um, and you know, then I have a function which you know takes in the dictionary from Kafka and writes it out to Cassandra. And then I just have this internal loop from, you know, every time a message comes, I can find a message, Kafka, and then add it to DB, that's it. Now for using um, Kafka connection, it does more than this. Um, it, allows it, it allows it to run on the Kafka cluster so it can scale. Um, also keeps track of where you're reading from. So if the machine goes down, then um, it does a snapshot of where you're reading in the Kafka screen and so you can go back and rerun it from there. Yeah, so but again, we're just creating, you know, a small little piece of code that does one part of the puzzle, not a big application. And then again, um, to create a sales summary. Um, again, I'm doing in Python. And again, I'm just demonstrating how to make a connection work. So I need to read from sales again. Um, I want to write to sales summary. And then what I do is I keep on reading from messages. If I get fixed number of them. And then I write out the, um, and I keep a total, and then um, I, I write that out and reset the total. And so again, it's just you know, literally in one slide, right, with, I think the font is 24 point, that's the entire program, which is pointed out of one uh, Kafka stream during some processing and put it in the other. Um, this is sort of indicative of what 
you know, in the microarchitecture, well, it's not serverless yet, service, serviceless yet, but, um, you know, it allows you to put together, you know, the, the stream, the process information, um, fairly quickly and independently of most pieces. Um, And then I am able to import the data um, in the Tableau, which we'll talk about in a minute, but you know, getting a sum of, and you know, the sales is pretty erratic because it's basically a minute, and generated by random numbers. Okay, any questions? Okay, in that case, I want to um, go to document 23. Um, first things, uh, a few days ago, um, this comic appeared on XACD, and as someone pointed out, it describes data science pretty well. Um, the basic message is you have data, anytime you start transforming it, doing operations on them, you're getting, you're losing precision, right? So, you know, first of all here is like, okay, precise number plus precise number gives you a slightly less precise number, right? Um, And once you add garbage to picture, you're getting garbage. Um, so one of the, you know, we've talked about, you know, pandas doing, you know, various data manipulations there. Look at Spark, um, doing on a cluster. Um, let's say Coffee Bell stream data, um, Cassandra through database. Um, the next step, if we have a lot more time, is at some point you're going to want to be able to display this data. Um, and so it's, you know, this piece of the puzzle. And I'm sure you've seen, you see this every day now. Um, you know, for example, here is um, COVID19India.org and they're displaying on a web page the table. You know, we got this color map. Um, we also have this nice little um, graph. So at some point we need to be able to play this in you know, various ways and the web is one natural place to do it um, either to the public or to internally to the company so people can track what's going on. Um, the COVID-19 India people are using React to do it. Um, and so these are just all these graph, all these graphs and these tables are React components they're using. You now the R3.Live people, um, all these images are the images, um, SVG format and JavaScript with all these various things to it. Um, COVID tracker. Um, there's another one, and they're using ArcGIS to generate all the graphs. 
We're using the RTS software to generate this and put it on the web. There are a lot of different systems people use. Um, I wanted to mention one, um, which is D3, and it's a JavaScript library, which um, designed just to display data. Um, here's just, you know, some of, this, some of the graphs I can produce. So now if we had another three, four weeks, I the country to spend time you know, going through D3. Um, this like a course that means diving into the world of JavaScript, which is sometimes a quagmire. There's all kinds of things to worry about. So I'll just mention this in passing. The other one I want to talk about briefly is Tableau. And Tableau came out of Stanford. Um, you know, there were several professors and graduate students who were busy doing visualization research. Um, so Tableau is a, a system you buy, what you actually you pay a monthly fee for, and it does. Um, quite a bit of visualization for you. Um, and I this is actually really can't see this very well. I spent a lot of time yesterday trying to make things more visible. Um, but I was able to do you know, quite a number of assignments. So here is a treat one starting from scratch. And literally, we drag and drop things um, into columns and rows. Oh, I got it wrong. All right, so now we can flip it the other way. Whoops. 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 Um, here we go, back. Um, all right, so again, the trip tweet, the trunk tweets, just dragging and dropping things into um, columns and rows. And I to make sure I get the. Right, so there we go. Right, we have the trunk trees per year. Um, and then we can do things like, well, let's do it by month. You know, you got tool tips automatically, which. And then we'll go by hour. And let's try to look familiar to a few people and get tool tips. And we can, you know, do some simple matching. So fake news. All right, so now we're getting you know, fake news. And we're getting rid of the date gives us the code number. Of course, it's, so it's not.
Now, has there ever been any number of tweets per hour with fake news mentioned? Um, one more example. On the weather data, um, And again, looking at all weather events um, per year, and then we can start doing it um, per month. Color coded by different types, right? It allows us um, to do a fair amount of work. Um, I'm only doing very simple things here. There's um, I'm just going to San Diego. Here we have it in the data just for San Diego County. Um, so I can do, do a lot more. Um, I was able to do, you know, some of the data analysis with. Um, You know, COVID-19 information, um, it took them, took some, took them all to do it because of the way that it was set up. Um, they doing names, um, was somewhat difficult, um, that blog because there's so many files. Um, it's easy to load that many files in, but you want to combine them into one, one data set. Um, you want to do it, but basically, you had to do a number of um, combine them one by one, and there's so many. Um, so it's, it's not a good replacement when you have to do a lot of manipulation of data, um, but if you're just looking at um, doing data and doing, um, in some cases, you know. Pretty sophisticated analysis um, works really well. Um, now, of course, you're smart enough to come to universities, is it's free for faculty and students. Um, so, once you graduate, um, I think for a single license, it costs you $70 a month. Again, that's just another tool to help visualize. Yes, yeah, Salesforce owns a company, yes. Um, can you use Tableau? Um, there is a learning curve. Um, you know, if you're interested in doing that, talk to me doing Apple solvers and we can talk about it. Any other questions? So, 
nothing when I come to the end of the class. Um, the question is, you know, the students want to continue learning, what can they do? Um, so I've got some references I, I typically follow here. Um, for this course, um, one that is relevant is you know, the website highscalability.com. And it talks about how you, you know, it gives examples of the companies how they manage to scale up. Um, so my deep interest in people here, if you're ever thinking of interviewing at um, Google, um, you should follow this website to at least be familiar with some of the terms. And Mal, do you have a question? Or is that from before? Uh, that was from before, sorry. Okay, yeah, I just... Well, you know, it's a good but it's a good what site to read about and if you're interested in, in really scaling up things. Um, I'm trying to keep track of what's going on. Um, you know, look at Hacker News. Is this just a site where people um, post things in terms of programmers, hackers? Um, this is what I read daily to keep track of what's going on in our industry. Um, Arn follow, followers, Nicole's Blinky. Um, it's very good. His he works at ThoughtWorks. ThoughtWorks is sort of a high end consulting company. So they will. They get hired to do projects with companies. They get hired to consult for projects and companies. They get hired when companies um, get in trouble and want need some help to you know fix the software. Um, and Martin Fowler writes a lot about software development, software engineering. Um, he has various guides, the software architecture guide is interesting. He does have, you know, articles on serverless, on microarchitecture. Um, and his latest um, big article was on what he calls the elephant architecture where companies start moving from Big applications to microarchitecture, and they don't do it right. And so, um, we talked about you know how companies should go about doing that. Um, you know, so you know, it's talking about right service architectures, microservices, um, which are relevant to things that. We talked about recently. Um, um, the other thing that is interesting is usually every quarter they produce what we call the technology radar. Um, we're late this year, they haven't posted one this year. Um, but they talk about new techniques, tools, platforms, languages, and frameworks, and which ones are stable enough for companies to really adopt. Um, they're talking mainly about large companies. Startup companies tend to be a bit more um, or less risk diverse. So they so you know, look at four different types of things and they rank them in four different categories. Um, and the last one, techniques to adopt, right? We're talking about microarchitecture, you know, pipelines. Um, you 
you know, various things. Um, this one caught my eye because like, what is Zong Kai? And, you know, it's a software development process that came out of Alibaba. Um, and that, of course, leads me to Conway's Law. Um, which basically says that New organizations design systems, which we do in software, that the, um, the thing you produce is going to mimic the structure of the company. Um, and so I'll see the full set, you know, it, give examples of what you got for a group for a compiler, you're going to get a four pass compiler. Um, and so when you build the comp company structure becomes important. So that's, the company structure actually is part of your software development process. Um, and you think about it, you know, what organization best suits what you're trying to build. And your techniques, uh, data mesh uh, is important to us. Um, And it's basically we're talking about we need to um, scale things up, but we want to use a stupid architecture. Um, then you can frameworks. Um, you know, for us, you know, TensorFlow, which people have been using for some time. Platforms, you know, some you know, Apollo stuff is again, it's, it doesn't take long to go through this. Um, you know, one is is Delta Lake, um, Databricks is a company that um, basically came out of the um, Spark development process and so that they push Spark, they'll twist the Spark, and so. Um, Cadillac is one of the products we're pushing. And then some more general things. Um, this article was written some time ago. Here's the Utah. And there's the link. And And I suspect lots of people are interested in this one. Um, and then they can interested in that. And hopefully you're interested in at least the last one. Um, and it says, look, your resume doesn't tell you how good a programmer is. And you know, I know often people, some people who and interview programmers and some you hire and they just aren't as good as they thought they were. Um, portfolio is something you can use to show what you've done, right? Are you doing projects? Um, one of the reasons I want to do projects in my courses is students can use that as a portfolio and say, look, here's something I did. I, I thought of it, I did it for course yet, but it's something bigger than it's more interesting than this assignment. Um, so if you want to improve your chances of you know finding good work is build portfolio projects. If you've got time to work on open source projects, um, that can help. Anything you can add to say here's not just bullet points and resume, but Oh, here's here's what I've done. Um, be productive and do something interesting. Blogs, projects, um, GitHub, um, you know, all these things you can use to build up a portfolio to build up your 
scalability to companies. Um, there is this image as a programmer, as a person who just sits the keyboard, um, hacks all day. Um, if you work in a company, you realize that's not the case, you have to communicate um, with the team. Um, there are times when you may think the team should do it this way and not that way. And often you decide which way you go is who's better at explaining their position as opposed to what is a technical actor thing to do. Um, right. You know, so there's a good reference insights. Um, I know when it usually when I get master's students doing a thesis, um, they work on the project, they've done the coding part, the analysis part. Um, they think they're done, and then they start writing the thesis document and it's sort of shocked because it takes a long time. I remember I had one graduate student who um, excellent programmer, um, did very good work. Um, so it took him a long, long time to get writing. He, was, he wasn't used to that. Um, so at one point he had a quota of writing one page a week. In the first few weeks, he barely managed. Um, I know Windows is uh, popular, it's cheap. Um, the Linux and Unix are very commonly used. Um, and Unix philosophy is quite useful. Um, are you familiar with you know, how to do these things, right? Um, of course, make files and the various other make systems these days. Um, right, these are all things that people expect. Um, you know, various things you should be able to do. Um, people expect that, you know, some of the computer science would be to be able to, you know, to be able to do these things. Um, Side note on this one. And once in this, really good programmers, and they're working on this big project, and they didn't like it. And one of their colleagues thought he was not very smart. Um, so they um, had great fun at um, hacking his machine so that it was make random noises and sounds at various times. Mm. Not a good use of that, that particular ability, but should be able to, should be able to do it. Um, and again, what type of things do people expect you to be able to do as a computer science major? Um, and yeah, usually people try to students like to follow the most, most popular language, whether it be Java or Python. Um, what can I say? Long, long time ago, when I was an undergraduate, 
the language to learn was PL1, which I'm sure none of you heard of before. Um, now the graduate students, um, popular language El Gol, and down the hall there was this, I can floor below me, there was this team the graduate students working on this language called UCC Pascal. Um, and that's coming from you know, much of my first job. Um, I worked at Bell Labs for a year. They were, you know, asking me, well, are people going to use Modular 2 or Ada? Um, and the answer was neither. You know, so languages come and go. Um, Professor, I have a question. Yeah. Do you, I mean, so I've worked with bunker programmers before, the ones who don't really communicate. <laughs> what yeah. would you recommend is the best way to, you know, get them to share their work and things like that? Because it's really hard for, I mean, we had, our, our team had a really hard time um, working with them. Well, the first step is, uh, not to hire that type, but that's very hard, right? Hiring, hiring people, technical people, is a very difficult, um, hard task. And, and, and my wife works for a company, and she continually complains about very people have hired because it, they're not going their way. Um, and yet these people go through, you know, day-long interviews where they interview multiple people. Um, that would be the first step. Um, and you should they keep on them, you know, how more important it is that they communicate um, as they on. Um, if you're paying them, you know, they, they should produce what you need. And communication is part of it. Gotcha. Thanks. You know, here is this sort of list of you know, languages to look into. Um, Racket's a really interesting one. Um, it's, it's a version of Lisp. Um, they're doing some very interesting things. You know, Haskell is sort of the, the functional language that Uber geeks like, like to learn and use. Uh, Squeak is a version of Smalltalk. Um, Alan Kay, who was the person who is now called the, the father of both a personal computer and the father of object learning programming. Um, you know, created small talk in the 70s. Um, and then he went to do many other things. And at one point, he was very dissatisfied with the state of programming languages. They said, well, let's, let's go back and resurrect the old version of small talk with open source so they could do experiments. Um, it's also an interesting system to look at. Racket, right? And this says about Racket. Um, if you haven't looked at Lisp, um, first time you do, it's just crazy because it doesn't look like a programming language. Um, once you get over that, you realize um, it's just syntax, and there's many different ways of doing syntax. Um, and that's important. Um, if you ever taken a programming language where you cover multiple languages and list one of them. 
usually what happens is you learn to hate it because it's so different and it takes too long to absorb it. But if long well, before you've got time to do that, you um, move on to your language in that course. You really need to give it lots of time. Um, Like a squeak. Um, computer science students need to understand the architecture. Um, yeah, we, we require that all great all graduate students in the program. You either have often person or take an often person to get here because it's not important to spend it does. Um, yeah, this, here's what you know, he says you should be able to do. Um, yeah, these days, if you're a computer science student, you really understand networking, um, how it works. It's so essential. Um, uh, um, I used to teach a course where that was one in the project with COVID to the client. Um, Right, is um I think we should be able to do the science before security is a huge issue big deal now. Um one of the famous hackers um of an older era. Um, but amazing things um, was able to use the FBI's um, phone system to make long distance phone calls for free. Um, how did he get access to the FBI um, phone system? He just called them up and asked them for the code number. That was it. Um, and they gave it to him. Um, but it's very clever, right? He um, first he figured out who worked at a particular office. So, and he also was able to determine when that person was on vacation. And then he called up Secretary and said, Look, I'll you know, contact your so and so, and he blah, blah, blah. Um, he was able to just get the information he needed to access the FBI, um, log into the network, and use it for years. Great. You know, all these things. Um, and I think I need to adopt this one where as part of an assignment, I ask students to do also create test cases um, that will break other students' code, right? Um, if you really want to understand this session, uh, look at this book. Um, He doesn't talk about computers directly, but he talks about all kinds of graphs, which shows you um, lots of interesting subtle details. And the graphics, um, lots of good hacks there. 
And he goes on to talk about you know, various things that you know about all these. So, uh, Nick Black is a graduate student at Georgia Tech. Um, Right, um, from these articles, like read the pages and make sure you check the return values. Um, you know, be part of the community. Mm. What can I say? I had a student from Two and a half years ago, contact me and said, Well, you know, you want to work on that project I did for the class and make it into something that's in the app store. Um, where you're working on a computer crash and you need a backup. You need a backup. Um, and you know, at some point in your life, you're one of your machines is going to die. Um, let's see. It was the last last fall semester? Um, two hours before I had my first class, my machine died. Um, these things happen. Um, I have an RSS reader that I look at every day, look at various articles, try and keep up what's going on. Um, yeah, this is um, I have this experience all the time. Look at something you really want, you know, he was back and like. What was I thinking? Why didn't I do that better? Um, I tell my students, you know, you all have had this experience working on projects, right? And you close to the deadline, you get very nervous about making changes. Um, and there are two things you can do to reduce that tense feeling you get. And one of them is um, use a source control system. So if you break something, you can go back easily and. Um, somehow it can be surprisingly Difficult to get students to do this. Um, years ago, I had two students. They had lots of industrial experience. They, they graduated undergraduate, and then they went to work for years and they came back to graduate school. And you know, they were taking a class of mine looking at projects. And even they, like at one point, said. Wait, why are we mailing files back and forth? Why don't we, why don't we set up a, you know, a GitHub account so we can just push it up there and get the latest. Um, and that's it. Um, I hope you found this course interesting and useful. And I hope that everyone has surviving in this all classes online situation and that we all um, survive this COVID-19 situation without getting sick. Any questions? Uh, professor?
Yeah. In one of these slides, you showed uh, you you were talking about the TensorFlow, and I saw there was a, another framework, Swift UI, on the right side, and these languages or, or these libraries were under the columns trial and assess. Right. I was just I was just wondering what does that mean. Um, so that's just from the ThoughtWorks um, radar, and what they're doing is they're trying to advise large companies on when it's safe to use things. Right? And large companies are pretty risk averse. They don't want they don't get to try new technologies right away because technologies. Um, when they're very new, they've got more bugs, right? They're not complete. Um, the documentation isn't, isn't there yet. There's no stack of the questions. And so they tend to like more mature um, technologies. So they don't have this you know, bad experience where they learn a technology, try to introduce it into their stack, and then it goes away or it can't perform. Um, so they, they, they break their recommendations into, well, it's now safe. This thing has been proven. It's useful. So, so, so you can use it in production. Um, trial means it's getting close to that. Um, so you may want to do you know, a small little project in it to get in-house experience with it and decide whether it's good for you or not. Um, and if I go back to um, right, so um, right, so DOP is like, okay, it's, it's secure, it's stable, use it. Um, Trial means, yeah, I mean, it, it's looking good. Um, doing, a, doing a small project handle the risk. Um, assess means, yeah, look, you know, have a programmer look into it, read about it, think about, you know, how it's going to be useful for your company. Um, hold is like a little bit too early. Um, Gotcha. Thank you, Professor. Question. So, for example, um, there is the like Swift UI. It's in beta, um, and it only runs on. Um, under the current version of iOS. So if you build a product on it using SwiftUI right now, um, the you, you reduce your market, and some beta, the company, um, Apple hasn't said that they won't change some of the APIs under you. So it's just too early to actually use in production. It's too dangerous. Um, come the summer, it may become out of beta, um, then it becomes um, we, let me move over to uh, trial. Good? Yeah, thank you, Professor. Now, in a related note, um, there is a connection between these two. Um, that, you know, so TensorFlow is this library that Google um, supports. Um, and again, it, it does the standard thing you see in, in Pandas is that if you use TensorFlow um, through Python, Python really is just a interface to the C code that's running underneath. Um, Get the performance. Now, um, what has happened recently is when you look at um, neural networks, um, 
the neural network at some point, you need to take the gradient descent, which is basically the slope. Um, so you take a derivative of that slope. Um, and that becomes a problem of tensor flow because um, all the work is being done in C. Um, so this tensor flow has limited capability to do the gradients. And so Google is starting a new project. Um, they're writing tensor flow in Swift. Um, why? Because in Swift now, when you want to take a gradient of a, of a data set, you can't do that in Swift um, without reservation. So there is now a, will be a, there's a dated version of TensorFlow written in Swift for that reason. Okay, unless there's any further questions, I think we're done for the day. Um, like I said, this will be the last formal lecture I give in this class. I will be here for the next two weeks. Um, if you've got questions, I'll talk about um, the projects, of course, or um, graduate affairs. Okay. So that's it for today. I hope everyone has a good weekend. Thank you, Professor. Thank you, Professor. Thank you.